Okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get this started. I want to thank everybody for coming on behalf of staff council and welcome everyone here. This is the first of what's going to be a monthly coffee, staff development coffee, if you will. And i um, very excited to have Professor McAndrew come today and talk. He's going to talk today on leadership styles. And on that note, we as a staff council, we're open to ideas. We want to do this each month. So if you have topics, ideas, most like to use internal speakers, but we also probably have some budget for some external speakers. Let us know. Let us know. Hey, there's so. a budget for speakers? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear about this. <laughs> it's our friendship, right? <laughs> but uh, so, so let us know if you, if you have any other ideas. But very lucky to have Frank today, long time, not psychology professor, great person. And without further ado, go ahead and turn it over to you, Frank. Thank you. Uh, and just to repeat something that I said a little earlier, people have come in since then. I, I've given you two questionnaires. Um, one of them, the one that says understanding your leadership style, we're definitely going to be talking about and doing today. And it's more fun if you know something about yourself as we're talking about this. So uh, you, you are going to fill that one out. Um, and I will allow a little time in the middle of the talk here to do that too. But if you were here early and wanted to work on it now, that's fine. The other one, the SD3 scale, I just don't think we're going to have enough time for you to both fill this out and then for us to kind of go over it. So um, I'll talk about some things related to that that you will then be able to fill this out later on and see where you stand. Uh, the people who just came in need to get some questionnaires as well. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do today is talk about leadership in a very specific way. Um, psychologists have been studying leadership for a long time, and they studied it from a whole lot of different directions. But one of them uh, is known as the trait approach to leadership. By the way, the PowerPoint's not working, so I'm just kind of going through the slides without all the bells and whistles. Um, the idea here was that leaders are born, not made and that there's something special about people who rise to positions of leadership. And this way of thinking about leadership was inspired by uh, those people out there that everybody could identify as great leaders. They're sometimes called transformational leaders. Uh, people like Martin Luther King and Gandhi, and yes, even Hitler, um, for all of his faults, was certainly successful as a leader for a while and was very charismatic. And the idea was that there's something that all leaders have in common. There are some qualities or traits that make them rise to the position at the top. And if we can just figure out what those are, we can predict who's going to be a good leader and identify these people and kind of nurture them. Uh, but for a long time, it was kind of a dead end. Um, the problem was they were looking for leaders in so many different situations combat leaders in the military, CEOs of corporations, leaders of women's church groups. And these are pretty different settings. And what makes for a great leader in one place doesn't necessarily make for a great leader in the other place. And so it was back to the drawing board. And let's figure out which traits predict which kind of leadership in which situations. So what I'd like to do today, and that's what the questionnaires are all about, is talk about a couple of different personality traits. Uh, and you'll have a chance to assess yourself on each of these in sort of a superficial way um, that are related to leadership. And talk a little bit about which circumstances make for um, good leaders using one trait versus another trait and so forth. And so it's a chance for you to learn a little bit about yourself as well as about leadership in general. So. Uh, let's, uh, at this point, why don't I give you a couple of minutes to get that questionnaire that says understanding your leadership style filled out. And I can, I've got extras up here, and if you don't want to fill this out, this is just for you. So, you know. Well, why don't we take a break from this, uh, and <laughs> if you've even got the very first one done, I can talk about that, and maybe a better strategy would be for me to go through all of the uh, different traits and describe them to you and then later on at your leisure you can 
do all the math and then see how you fit in there, okay? Because, um, yeah, it doesn't seem to be time well spent just spend filling out questionnaires. Okay, the first one, though, um, is the self-monitoring scale. And let me tell you what this is all about. Now, if you've already scored this, uh, the higher your score on this, the more you are a high self-monitor. And you notice in the picture I've got a chameleon. And there's a reason for that. Self-monitoring is a personality trait that essentially sorts people out according to how good they are at understanding how they're being received by other people. So uh, if I'm in front of an audience or even talking to one person, I understand how that person, are they getting my jokes? Are they still with me? What are their, I'm, I'm good at reading them. But I'm also good at reading situations. So when I step into a new situation, be it a social situation or a work situation, I'm pretty good at figuring out what the rules are. How am I supposed to behave here? What are the expectations of other people? And am I meeting those expectations? A person who's high in self-monitoring is very good at these things. And hence the chameleon, because they are good at giving the people what they want. I understand what this group expects from me, and I'm going to give it to you. Uh, I understand how you're responding to me, and I'm going to adjust my behavior to manipulate that as well as I can. Not surprisingly, people who score high in self-monitoring are more likely to rise to positions of leadership, and they're more successful when they get there. Now, this doesn't mean that if you're low in self-monitoring, you can't be a good leader. It just means that some of the other traits we're going to come across will be things that you will be relying on more than your self-monitoring. Sharon? What about the person who um, can read those things and is good at reading them, what's wanted, but chooses not to modify their behavior. So it seems like there's a difference between not being able to figure it out, not being there able is. to read the social cues, and choosing not to... The high self-monitor is the person who does both, okay. by definition. Now, this can be good or bad, right? The good thing is the person is very adaptable, uh, easily fits into new situations, connects with people well. But the downside of this could be that you never know what you're getting. Is this the real person? Or are they just putting on an act for me? Uh, so they can be perhaps being accused of being superficial or disingenuous. The low self-monitor, on the other hand, is the person who is a little bit more oblivious about how they're being perceived by others and less willing or able to change to match situations. And they just kind of plot into every situation the same way. Now, the upside of that, of course, is what you see is what you get. The person is sincere. Um, you can trust that what you're getting from this individual is, in fact, what the individual is feeling and thinking. But sometimes you don't want to do that, right? You want to be able to moderate things a little bit and uh, go with whatever's going on in the situation. Now, it isn't an either-or thing. We talk about it like it's e you're either a high self-monitor or, or a low self-monitor. All of these personality traits, and all personality traits in general, are on a continuum. Uh, we talk about like extroverts and introverts as if they're two categories of people. Think of it like being old or being tall. You've got really young people and really old people, and you fall somewhere along that line. You've got really short people and really tall people, and you fall somewhere along that line. Well, self-monitoring and these other traits are the same way. You've got the lunatic fringe low self-monitors and the people at the other extreme, and you can be somewhere in between. So if you're really high or really low on this, for you, this trait's going to be a pretty good predictor of your behavior. If you're somewhere in the middle, not extremely high or low, then for you, other traits are going to be more powerful controllers of how you act in situations. And this doesn't just have to do with how you deal with other people. Whether you're a high or low self-monitor says things about the kinds of information you attend to. For example, if you're in advertising and you're selling cars, a high self-monitor is going to respond to ads that give them information about how to present themselves. And so a car uh, commercial that tells you something about the kind of image you would have by driving a car like this would be more effective for somebody who's high in self-monitoring. The low self-monitor, this would be lost on them. That person wants to hear about the warranty and the gas mileage and stuff that really doesn't have anything to do with presenting themselves. So um, self-monitoring is one of these traits 
that is quite relevant to how one behaves in interpersonal situations. And if you fill out this scale, you probably won't be surprised at what you find. It, you already probably know if you're high or low in self-monitoring, even if you've never heard of the concept before. Once I describe it, you can say, oh yeah, you know, that's me one way or the other. All right. Now the next two things. Wait, oh, I'm sorry. Tell what is, what is oh, what is, uh, what okay. Is well, I, I was not assuming that anybody had this all put together yet. All right. I, you add up those two numbers on section A to get your self-monitoring score. And the other thing about personality scores, there, there's no firm cutoff. If I was doing an experiment where I wanted to have high and low self-monitors, what I would do is just get all of your scores, see where they were, and just sort of draw a line in the middle. And so the top half of you would be my high self-monitors. But on the back side, there is a little scale that tells you uh, for self-monitoring and each of the other traits, what your percentile would be. So basically, if you got a three or a four, you're a real low self-monitor. You're in the bottom 10% of that scale. On the other hand, if your score is up in the 13, 14, 15 range, you're in the top 10% on that, and you are a high self-monitor. So what you can do is add your two numbers together from the key, and then see where your number compares to the numbers in the self-monitoring column. And that will place you. If you got more than 25, you made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and if you got a negative number, you made a mistake. <laughs> so the rule of thumb, just to make it very simple, is if you're down in the low single digits, five, six or so or less, you are a real low self-monitor. And if you're up over 12, you're a high self-monitor. And then, uh, you know, somewhere in between those, you're somewhere in between. Okay, any other questions about that before I talk about the next one? I'm actually going to talk about the next two at once, the ones that would have been section B and C. Uh, because they both are essentially telling you the same thing. This is going to be a little mo more, I'm going to make it sound a little more simple than it actually is, but uh, you think of people as falling into one of two different types of leadership styles. Person-oriented leaders or task-oriented leaders. And now we're not going to think about self-monitoring at all. That's a completely different thing. We're now talking about a, a different trait. Person-oriented leaders are people who are really concerned with relationships within groups. If I'm a person-oriented leader and I'm the leader of this group, I want you guys to like each other. I want you to get along. And I want you to like me. And I want us all to be kind of happy. And I become preoccupied with that. I get very upset if I think there's discord in the group or if people are, are disgruntled about something. Um, and if I'm a person-oriented leader, I also tend to think well of people. I believe that most workers are actually sincere people who want to do a good job, and I trust you to work hard. They're sometimes called theory Y leaders. Now, if you're a task-oriented leader, you're a theory X leader, you don't think so well of people. You think most people are lazy and that they're going to do as little as humanly possible unless you're on them. And you're not that worried about whether people are happy. You're not that worried about whether people are getting along. And you don't care if people like you that much either. You want to get the job done. You're focused on the task. And whatever human carnage has to take place in order for that to happen, <laughs> that's OK. As long as the job gets done, you're happy. And so you can evaluate people on the extent to which they're person-oriented or task-oriented. And again, think of this as not just your one or the other. It's a continuum. You can be extremely task-oriented or extremely person-oriented, or you can be somewhere in the middle. Now, these next two scales are different ways of assessing that. <coughs> Section B is something called the least preferred coworker scale. <laughs> and for those of you who did not actually fill this out, I'll, I'll describe it. Uh, you simply ask somebody to think of an individual that they know, not a hypothetical person, think of a real person you know, 
And it doesn't have to be somebody that you work with right now. It could be somebody you worked with at a previous job. But think about that person. And then go down that list of adjectives and check the adjective that you think describes that individual. Now what you find by doing this LPC scale, as it's called, I forget what my slides look like. Yeah, OK. Is that a person-oriented leader describes even the person they dislike working with the most in fairly positive terms. So if you think about that individual that you really don't like to work with, and you're still not saying terrible things about them, you're probably a person-oriented leader. Task-oriented leaders, on the other hand, have no compunction about just letting them have it. Uh, this is the person I hate working with, and I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> and they tend to say different things about them. Um, when the person-oriented leader describes the person that they least like working with, the negative adjectives they pick tend to be things that have to do with the person's interpersonal abilities. Uh, they will describe them as untrustworthy or unfriendly. If the task-oriented leader is describing their least preferred co-worker, they'll more often use terms that have to do with their ability to do the job. They'll describe them as stupid or lazy. Uh, so it's things that have to do with getting things accomplished rather than interpersonal things. So which things you pick and how many, how severely bad they are, will tell you something about whether you're a person or a task-oriented leader. Section C of the scale is sort of a more direct way of measuring uh, your person-oriented or task-oriented abilities. And those two scores ought to line up pretty well. Uh, I, it, it shouldn't be that you score really high in task-oriented on one and really high in person-oriented in the other. They, they ought to go together. But I have done this in my classes, and I have learned that it does not always seem to work that way. And I'm just going to ignore that for the time being. Um, now, to know what your scores are, and, and if you haven't done this yet, it's OK. Just kind of figure this out later on for yourself. Again, on the page 330 here, you can look at LPC and task orientation scales. And uh, the higher your number is, the more likely you are to be, let me remind myself, is it a task-oriented person? Person-oriented. OK, all right. The more likely you are to be person-oriented, the higher your scores are. So the one LPC, but on the task, is the opposite. OK, all right. That's good to know. So task is section C. Task is section C. LPC is section B. The higher number on LPC means you're person-oriented. The higher number on section C means you're task-oriented. But they ought to tell you the same thing. They ought to. All right, now, does it matter? Who's the better leader? Well, it turns out it depends. You can be a very effective leader, whether you're person-oriented or task-oriented. You just need to be able to recognize the situations in which you're going to be most effective. And there is a school of thought that says that you can kind of change to meet the situation. So you can become a task-oriented leader when you need to. You can become a relationship-oriented leader when you need to. I'm skeptical of that. We are who we are. And if you're a task-oriented leader, you can try to be as warm and fuzzy as you want to be. They're going to see right through you. And the opposite way. If you're a person-oriented leader and you say, well, I'm going to let that go and just worry about getting the job done, you can't let it go. You know, it's just part of who you are. OK. So there's been a lot of research on this, hundreds and hundreds of studies with basketball teams and community groups and the Belgian Navy and all kinds of other <laughs> odd things. And they've all pretty consistently shown the same thing. What you really need to look at to see who's going to be more effective is the favorability of the situation. A favorable situation for a leader is when the task is highly structured. It's clear what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. It's not at all uncertain or fuzzy. Uh, and if that's clear, then it's a favorable situation. Does the leader have power? Are you in a position where you can actually promote people, fire people, reward people? You have actual power that you can bring to bear to make things happen or not. And if you have a lot of power, the situation is favorable for you. 
And what are the relationships between the leader and the members of the group? A favorable situation, of course, is one where they like the leader, the leader likes them, everything's working. An unfavorable situation is where it's not so good. All right. Well, it turns out, based on all of these other studies that have been done, that the task-oriented leader does best in situations where the favorability for the leader is really, really good or really, really bad. If it's clear how we get the job done, and I have power, and you guys like me, then let's do it. And I'm going to focus on getting the job done. I'll be wasting time going around worrying about if everybody's happy and is everybody getting along and trying to. It's unnecessary. If the situation is horrible for me, it's not really clear what we need to do here. You don't like me. I don't really have any power. Well, God damn it, we're going to do this anyway. And I'm going to focus on the task. And because there's no amount of sucking up and peacemaking that I'm going to do to fix the situation. So we might as well focus on the task. However, if it's in between or it's unclear, you've got a new leader and it's not clear how the group feels about that person. It's not clear whether the task is structured or not. It's not clear whether the leader has any real power or not. In these situations, the person-oriented leader shines. The person-oriented leader is much more effective because any ambiguities get resolved in favor of the leader. If I had a group of people that might be predisposed to like me, but I come in and start barking at people and insulting them, I turn the tide against me and make the situation worse. On the other hand, if I'm more person-oriented and sensitive to those things, things get better if I'm a person-oriented leader. If the task is not very clearly structured and we need to communicate with each other and work this out together, a person-oriented leader is going to be much more effective in that situation. So it's not necessarily better to be a task leader or a person-oriented leader. It depends on the situation. So in high or low favorability, you want to be a task leader. Somewhere in the middle, you want to be a person-oriented leader. The problem, of course, in leadership situations is that things change, right? So things are not always favorable or always unfavorable. And recognizing, even if you can't change yourself, recognizing those situations in which you're going to be less effective can make you a better leader because you can then rely on other people or uh, use resources other than your style of leadership. Okay. Any questions about that one? Just checking our time here. We've got a little bit of time left. All right, let me move on to the next one then. Uh, in section D, you are filling out some uh, questions that assessed your need for certain things. Uh, there's a whole school in personality psychology that talks about our personalities really being driven by the things that we find satisfying. We have certain needs that have to be satisfied for us to be happy, productive people. And the three that are being measured there are the three that turn out to be most relevant to leadership behaviors. Need for achievement, need for power, and need for affiliation. So what that really means is this is the thing that gives you your rewards and presses your buttons. If you come to work every day and you're high in the need for affiliation, your pleasure and reward from work comes from the social interaction you have with other people. You enjoy working together with people to get things done. You enjoy the social give and take of the job. You enjoy the camaraderie of being part of a group. And that's really the reward that you get from coming to work. Yes, you achieve things and accomplish things, but the thing when you go home at the end of the day with a smile on your face is the enjoyment you got from being with other people. So if you're high in the need for affiliation, this is at the top of the things that motivate you. Now, it's useful when you're a leader to recognize what motivates different people. If you've got somebody in the office that loves to schmooze and is very sociable, you want to put them in situations where they get to do jobs that fulfill that. If you're high in the need for achievement, on the other hand, your real kick, it's not that you necessarily don't like to affiliate with people or you're not sociable, 
But the thing that really rewards you is finding out something about your abilities. You like feedback about how good you are. And so you want that person in a situation where they're able to constantly monitor how competent and skillful they are. And even in simple little laboratory tasks, you can see how people act differently if they're different in the need for achievement. Let's suppose we had a little ring toss game where I put a peg on the floor and you had a little rope ring or something you were going to throw over it. And you bring people in and you tell them, OK, your task is to get as many of these rings on the peg as you can. And you'll win a little bit of money for each one you put on there. Well, the person high in the need for achievement spends a lot of time figuring out, OK, exactly how far away do I stand from this thing to make it really challenging? And, and if I get it, I feel good about myself. Um, and the money is almost irrelevant. They want to they show that they can do this. Now, a person really low in the need for achievement may do one of two things. They might stand right over the peg and just drop the ropes on it because <laughs> they want the money and they don't care how good they are at this thing. Or they'll stand impossibly far away and just fling the thing. Whereas if they happen to get it, it's just a matter of luck. It really doesn't have anything to do with skill. Um, so their behavior in that situation can really be different depending on how they are in this need for achievement. Now, if you're high in the need for power, the thrill you get is from being in charge. You like making things happen. You like influencing other people. You like having the group go in directions that you choose and doing things that you have decided to do. Now, right away, you think of this in a negative way, right? That this is some power-hungry tyrant that's bossing people around. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way. A person who's high in the need for power can be a very effective leader. Uh, you need to have some other skills that you build in there so you don't run amok. But when this person goes home, the satisfaction that they get out of the job is, you know, I, I really made some people do something today. You know, I, I really had an effect. I influenced people. Now, when it comes to leadership, um, research has consistently shown that there is something called the leadership motive pattern. People who rise to positions of leadership more often than not have a combination of being very high in the need for power and very low in the need for affiliation. There are exceptions, but more than you would expect just by chance, the people who find themselves in leadership positions are the ones who like this influencing kind of thing. They like controlling the destiny of the group and of other people and being in charge of what happens to them as well. And they don't worry that much about whether people like them. They would rather be effective than well liked. They'd rather be respected or feared than liked. And so another way to think about this is, uh, forget about all the technical jargon over here. I just stole this from one of my classes. But um, why do you want to be a leader? Some people want to be leaders because they just like being in charge. That's the high need for a power. Uh, some people like being leaders, not because of the task itself, but because they get stuff. They get social status. They get a lot of money. And being a leader is just a way to do that. They don't really care about the leadership thing. Probably the type that we want to be leaders, but the ones who don't usually want to be, are the ones who do it because they're good citizens. Somebody's got to do this. There's the sense of duty. And so on most faculty committees, um, nobody ever wants to do these things. I'm chair of the personnel committee right now. I'd rather hang myself. But, <laughs> but it's an important job. It has to be done. And so you do it. And we're all a little suspicious when there's somebody at a faculty meeting who's volunteering to do one of these things. <laughs> you usually don't want the person who wants to do it <laughs> because you're suspicious of their motives, right? All right. So another way to think of yourself as a leader is to think about what are the things that drive you? What are the needs that are most salient to you? And if you're an achievement person, uh, recognizing that and being in situations where you can lead by getting things done to give you feedback uh, will be useful. If you know that you like controlling and influencing people, okay, that's who you are. 
recognizing that and using it to the best effect is what's due. And if it's about affiliation, then uh, the research indicates if you're real high in this, you're probably not drawn to leadership positions. But if you find yourself in one, you're probably a person-oriented leader too. So take that for what it's worth and be as effective as you can. But the take-home message is that every, all of you can be good leaders. It's just a question of recognizing which thing is going to give you your strength. Go ahead, Sharon. What if you're low in all of them? I was at the bottom of the scale in need for help, and you have the need for affiliation or need for change. Well, uh, <laughs> those, are just, those are just the three that we used as examples. Okay. There may be other sure. needs out there. Okay. Yes. A uh, need for a new personality scale might be the thing that... <laughs> so I don't know. But there's something out there, according to that perspective, that drives you. Now keep in mind, there are people who don't think it's that important. I'm giving you this smattering of right. different theories. Mm -hmm. There are people who will say, well, this need stuff is bullshit. You don't pay any attention to that. It's self-monitoring and other things that matter. So, you know, somebody in that camp would say, well, don't worry about it because it doesn't mean anything anyway. I'm just trying to give you a couple of different perspectives here. Okay. This one, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about, and it doesn't correspond to any scales that you had. There was a scale that went with it, and I just got rid of it because it was too long. The others are long enough already. But this is about recognizing, if you are a leader, what is the source of your power? What is the thing that permits you to be in that position of leadership? Because that is the thing that determines when you will be most effective with the group. It's called the impact theory, and that's an acronym that stands for these different terms, information, magnetic, position, and so on. I'm not going to worry about the specific terms. I'll just kind of run down the list here. Sometimes you're in a position of leadership because you have what's called expert power. You know something that the other people don't know. Okay, maybe in your office, you're the only one that knows how to make the computer software do what it needs to do. And the whole thing grinds to a halt if you are not there. So the basis of your power in this situation is the knowledge that you have that other people don't share. And this can be true, and I just used the computer example, but you can all think of examples from wherever you work of having some pull just because you know stuff that others don't. But that means the group is only going to be accepting your leadership authority as long as it's relevant to your area of expertise. And if you start bossing people around in areas that have nothing to do with your area of expertise, you lose all the credibility that you might otherwise have. If you have referent power, that means that the reason people have you as a leader is because they like you. And they want you to like them. You're this charismatic, magnetic person. And there are so few of us. <laughs> and the whole basis of your ability to lead is the fact that people want to stay in your good graces and want to work with you. And this is good, but if you don't understand that and you start trying to pretend to be an expert when everybody can see that you're not, or you start using some other power that you really don't have, you undermine your effectiveness as a leader. So what this perspective is all about is recognizing what is the thing that you have that makes you an effective leader and stick with that. And you're going to get in trouble when you start using other things. Legitimate power is you're just a leader because you're part of a hierarchy that people accept. So if I'm in the military and I'm a sergeant and a new captain is assigned to my battalion, I don't know this individual at all. I'm not in a position to know whether this person is competent. I don't know whether this person is likable. But I accept the fact that this person outranks me, and because they're in that position, then I accept them as a leader. And so your leadership authority comes from your position in the hierarchy. Now over here, there are words that tell you when these different bases of power are most effective. Expert power is most effective in a situation where people don't know what they're doing. That's when you're going to shine as a leader. Referent power is going to be most effective in situations where people are kind of bummed out and demoralized. And you have the ability to sort of give them a pep talk and uplift them and lead by example because they want to follow you and they want to be like you. Legitimate power, when there's instability, people like the reassurance of knowing the rules and knowing the structure and they will look to 
One of the first things in prisoners of war camps that they do is separate officers from enlisted personnel because that disrupts the chain of command and takes away that reassurance of knowing who one can look to for guidance. The other ones are pretty straightforward. Affiliation, um, I, won't, I won't talk about that one. It's too much like need for affiliation. A coercive power, your power just rests on the fact that you control the rewards and punishments. You can make people suffer or you can give people rewards if they do or don't do what you want. And you're not leading because you have expert power or because people like you, just because you control the good stuff and the bad stuff. Tactical leadership style, if you're a planner and good at making strategies, you're going to be a good leader when you're in a disorganized place. Now, I know here at Knox there are no disorganized offices. <laughs> but if you worked in some other place, and there's just sort of chaos. People are duplicating each other's jobs, and nobody really knows whether they're being successful or not. Having a person step up and just organize things and make plans and think ahead can make them a very effective leader. So in any situation where you've got some authority, and it can be something as small as a task force of three or four people that you've been assigned to where something has to get done in the next 10 weeks, recognizing what you may have at your disposal compared to the other people will help you be a better, more effective leader. Okay, I know that uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. So uh, let me pause for a moment here and ask if there are any comments or questions about this, and I'll just mention a couple other things because I know we have to get back to work. What about a situation where you're uh, sort of coerced into leadership? Okay. You're in the position of leadership. But you don't necessarily want to. I, I know the feeling. And um, what you have to do then is say, all right, I'm stuck here. What do I have to work with? Do I have anything going for me? And this is where you start examining, OK, given the situation I'm in, is there anything I can rely on here? Or you go back to some of the other things. Am I a task or a person oriented leader? And how can I use that to my advantage? Um, there's really two different things that psychologists study, but I've kind of smushed them all together. What are the things that make a person rise to a position of leadership? Or what are the things that make a person an effective leader once they get there? So you're talking about the situation of, I'm a person who might not ever rise to a position of leadership, but somehow this terrible thing happened. But given that that happened, what are the things that will not predict how effective you'll be? So they're really two different issues. And it turns out that there are some personality traits that we're not going to get to, but it's on the second questionnaire that are real good at predicting who's going to rise to a position of leadership, not so good at predicting who's going to be effective. Um, oh, yeah, let me just say a word. The section B, or the uh, project B, is your conflict resolution style. And um, if we had time, I would get into that in more detail. But how effective you are as a leader especially in a work situation, often depends on how good you are at managing conflict. And we're not really prepared for this, right? Most people get promoted to positions of leadership because they're good at the job that they were doing. Maybe you're a programmer or a salesperson or whatever it is, and you do that really well and you get promoted to be a manager where you don't do programming or sales anymore. They take away the thing you're good at and put you in a situation where you stink which is, you know, are people drinking in the parking lot on their lunch hour and these two people that work next to each other can't stand each other and they're fighting all the time. And it's your job to fix it. Um, so how do you manage conflict? The questionnaire that you've got describes um, five different styles. Whoops, I don't even know how that happened. Five different styles of managing conflict. And there's a little description in the questionnaire that'll tell you what each of them is. The sage, the diplomat, the ostrich, the philanthropist, and the warrior. Um, and you can read those descriptions. But it, in a, just to give you a nugget, the sage is probably the best. The sage is the person who recognizes a conflict situation as one where everybody can win here. This is an opportunity for us to actually change things for the better for both of us. And let's see if we can figure that out. The diplomat is really only worried about his or her outcomes, but they want a solution. And they're willing to compromise to make that happen, but they're still not too worried about the other person where the sage is. You can guess what the ostrich is, right? There's no problem here. 
There's no conflict. There's nothing to worry about. And needless to say, that doesn't go so well. The philanthropist is the pushover. The conflict is so unpleasant and aversive, I will do anything to make it go away, including giving up everything that matters to me just to have peace. And you probably recognize yourself in some of these descriptions. The warrior just wants to win and really doesn't care. I'm, the warrior might have gotten a better outcome by compromising, but that would have been good for the other person too, and I want to win. And that can be kind of a, it can work real, really well or really awfully. So when you fill out that questionnaire, you'll be able to figure out where you stand in that, and that will say something about the type of conflict management you would do as a leader. The last thing I was going to do, and I'm going to mention this just because this is that other questionnaire, the SD3. There are three personality traits that when you put them together are deadly. It's called the dark triad. <laughs> and these people will eat you alive. And they're very effective at getting to high levels uh, in organizations of all sizes. And the three personality traits, well, uh, I've got some examples of dark triad characters, James Bond, uh, House, Darth Vader, <laughs> Steve Jobs. This is Ted Bundy, the serial killer that, you know, yeah. raped and murdered all those women for years and they finally caught him. Uh, Bernie Madoff, you know, the, the scam guy that swindled everybody out of their life savings. Uh, religious cult leaders often are dark triad characters. Charles Manson, Jim Jones, the Jonestown guy. Um, but the three traits are narcissism, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism. And you can assess yourself on each of these three traits with the other questionnaire that I gave you. When you put those together, oh, it's yeah, but it's cutting off the top of the slide. But anyway, I'll, I'll go with it. <coughs> and I understand some of you have to leave, so you can take off any time. But when you put these all together, these are the uh, different traits that you'll commonly find among these individuals. Competitive and selfish. But the thing about these people that's so dangerous, they can be very charming when you first meet them. They're entertaining. They're fun. They draw you in. Um, they're not unpleasant people at all, which is why they're so successful. And the three traits, of course, are narcissism, um, these are the people who, now, you know, sometimes you hear that narcissists are insecure, right? They're just worried that they're not really worthwhile, so they put on this big front. No. If you're a narcissist, you truly believe it. You think you are great. You think you are special. You think you are entitled to things that other people are not entitled to. And if somebody else doesn't recognize this, you become incensed. You become outraged. Uh, it can result in quite aggressive uh, outburst. So if you have a highly narcissistic boss, which we also don't have at Knox, um, any challenge to that person's authority or sense of competence will result in a real backlash. I had a video clip to play of Trump. Uh, this was not a political statement of any sort. I made these slides long before Trump was even dreamed to be president. Um, and even Trump's friends admit he's a narcissist. Uh, he thinks very well of himself. And this was a clip about uh, when Rosie O'Donnell dared to say some bad things about him on The View. He just goes on and on and on. And he can't let it go, and that's, that's kind of the, the classic response. Psychopaths are the people who are uh, pathological liars and very parasitic. They, they use people up until they've got nothing else to give them, and then they throw them away. Sexual relationships, financial deals where they basically rob the person blind and then leave them behind. Uh, and there's no sense of guilt or remorse whatsoever. Machiavellianism, how willing are you to kind of manipulate people to get what you want? And if you're a high Mac, which is what they're called, you're also very likable and skillful. You're good at changing the situation to suit your needs. There's all kinds of fun little games you can play to demonstrate this. Uh, just to give you an example, there's something called the, the $10 game. You bring three people in, they've already filled out the Machiavellianism scale. One of them's really high, one of them's really low, one's in the middle. And you tell them, okay, here's 10 bucks. You can divide it up among any two of you, any way you want. So one person's gonna be completely left out and not get any money. And 
to give you the punchline, on average, high max walk out of these games with $5.57. <laughs> Middle max, $3.14. Low max, $1.29. So, uh, and the way the game would work would be, okay, if Carol and Julie and I were going to play, and Carol's the high max, she'll grab the $10 and turn to Julie and say, I'll tell you what, let's fit, split this 50-50, $5 each. And I say, hey, what about me? And then you turn to me and say, okay, I'll take six and you can have four. And then Julie says, well, wait a minute. And th then it goes from there. But she has taken control of the situation. She's the one, for, for unknown reasons, who suddenly is in charge of the money. And this is what high max tend to do. I know we're completely out of time, so I won't go on and on about this anymore. But on that second scale, uh, you can fill that out and see where you stand on those three different traits. And um, if anybody ever wants to talk to me about any of this, I, I'm happy to, like, if you want to fill out your questionnaire, I'll be happy to sit down and talk to you about it. So anyway, uh, but I think it's getting to be 1 o'clock and probably time to go. So thank you. Thanks, Frank.